Songs, an illustrated anthology of poems about birds. What is more, we imagine our poetry as bird song. Barbara Hamby's Thus Spake the Mockingbird, fantastic title, uh, concludes with bird and poet speaking as one. I am the choir here, my wild throat crowd the exploding sky. Oh, I can make a noise. Just as birds move our poetic urges, we also dream of moving in birdish ways. Humanity's first powered, heavier than air flight happened at Kitty Hawk. Too, though, the ancient legend of Icarus speaks of the possible harsh outcomes to flights of fancy. Birds' songs and flight possess beauty and freedom that we find achievable in some measure, but ultimately lack. Such powerful identification and longing gives wing to myriad senses of captivation, to be moved by something, but also to be held captive. I'd like to think a little bit about the ways this particular song, the song of the dusky seaside sparrow, might be variously moving. To help me do this, I'm briefly going to turn to John Lydgate, a late medieval poet monk. Lydgate's 15th century poem, The Churl and the Bird, captures birdsong's ability to move us. In the poem, a gardening peasant snares a songbird because of her efficacious singing, with which her song mocketh heavy heart to sleep, with which her song makes heavy heart sounds. How does the song of the dusky seaside sparrow move us? The song is three simple notes. First, a clear whistle, then a quick turn upward, called an upslurring by the American Birding Association, apparently. Finally, a lingering, oscillating tone, making the bird's song sound querulous, perhaps anxious. With that final tremble, the three-note song is, well, dusky, a sunset song. Maybe hearing wistfulness means I'm reading into, hearing into, this small bird's call. I hear in it the fact that this records the voice of a now extinct bird. From Florida, it had the smallest range of any in North America, confined to one island and a small area along the nearby St. John's River. In the mid-20th century, birders flocked to see the bird, which was included in the ABA's Checklist of North American Birds a book Mark Jerome Walters calls The Bible of the Dedicated Bird Watcher. The bird's constrained habitat was destroyed by DDT spraying to sanitize NASA's Kennedy Space Center. After a much publicized last ditch attempt by Disney World to, uh, to rescue it, the dusky seaside sparrow was declared extinct in 1990. The recorded notes of an extinct bird's song score just how present species destruction is. Sound recording is distinctly modern, uncomfortably contemporary. This recording, moreover, even as it now stands in for an entire subspecies, can only ever be of a particular voice. Both the universality and the particularity of this voice's wistful sonic beauty captivates. Work by Meredith West, an IU professor of psychological and brain sciences, shows that birdsong instructs newer generations. Bird song's power, it seems, isn't merely a literary trope, but a natural phenomenon. It's a kind of training in birdishness. Whom does the dusky seaside sparrow's fragile triplet now train? The song's only ours now, 